Thanks, Mark, for joining me once again. And uh, yeah, as we've mentioned before, there's a lot to discuss and catch up about um, with regards to CoinFlex, OpenX, and what's going on there. So I would say for a bit of background for viewers who may not know, I am a creditor of CoinFlex. And so I've been following this whole situation like pretty closely um, as I have like vested interest in it. So um, I would say probably one of the more knowledgeable people out there about what's going on here. And yeah, just trying to stay on top of it all. And I would say from my perspective, I know a number of other creditors felt similarly, is that like this year or the last couple of months at least that uh, we felt very like left in the dark and there wasn't really much going on except um, like notifications about all CoinFlex is shutting down and migrate over to OpenX and um, we have to complete the KYC and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So the first question that I wanted to ask of you is whether the CoinFlex restructuring agreement that we all signed on to, are you still on board with that or what's what's going on there? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. We've always been, I've always been on board with that. We've always been on board with that. And um, really, I, I see everything I've done this year as effectively an attempt to implement that to the best of my abilities. We we have, um, I believe we've completed the issuance of, of much of the shares, at least for people who've KYC'd. We've, um, we've obviously uh, done things related to the other distributions, but we are also building a business and we're building a business which if, if it succeeds, the beneficiaries of that, a significant percentage of the beneficiaries of that will be the creditors of CoinFlex. And so that's been our goal from day one. That was the plan from day one. That was what we're trying to do with OpenX. And I'm really excited now that um, now that we have this tender offer that people are finally getting issued shares in OpenX. You know, it's been it's been a frustrating journey trying to get these shares into people's hands. And uh, now we're we're finally unblocked. So it's it's been good. Yeah. Um. So I'll we'll get more to this this tender offer a bit more soon. But uh, maybe now's a good time to ask. Like, what is the difference between um, like having equity in CoinFlex versus now having equity in OpenX? Because like obviously it's not the same thing anymore. It seems like yeah. to me. Yeah. 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 I mean the there was basically a simple way to do it. Um, which was to have a board resolution uh, at the CoinFlex level and, and at the OpenX level uh, to, to handle the equity. Because they're basically, with the new exchange, um, it can't be the same equity split. You know, the 65%, um, we basically, uh, we showed that to investors and they said, well, how are the founders incentivized? How, is, how am I incentivized as an investor? This is, um, too much equity for for existing kind of old folks that are not bringing in new capital, and um, or not going to be working on the business. And and obviously, um, there is a lot of value that creditors bring, and there's a lot of value that the the CoinFlex estate brings. So so you have this you have this balancing act where the percentage needs to be right. But I think and and even the pe even the people that um, that are sort of opposing us online and kind of saying things about us online agree with the percentage breakdown. As far as I understand it, they, they think the percentage breakdown that I'm putting forward is, is fair. So the, um, the 25%, and, and this was, this was actually what was, um, what was basically agreed in the beginning of the year. This was something that we had discussed with many of the creditors, all the series B, but basically the whole, uh, large constituency was was a number around around that percentage. It was actually a little bit lower, twenty three and a half. And so um, and so there was an understanding uh, amongst all parties that CoinFlex should get a big stake in OpenX, um, but it, it's it's a danger for OpenX if that stake is too big, uh, especially if it's a majority. But if but if it's too big, you have problems around fundraising and 
uh, kind of team commitment to the business and that sort of thing. And so we, we narrowed, we, we kind of centered it on 25, but really this whole year we've been implementing the restructuring, um, both on the coin flick side, we've gone through the legal steps to, to implement the restructuring and on OpenX side, um, OpenX has been, I think, a partner to CoinFlex in actually creating that new business that CoinFlex creditors can can become shareholders in, and so that that had to be created. That was um, that, and that's been a beautiful thing to create. I think we've created something really unique here. So. Okay, um, so basically. CoinFlex creditors went from being offered 65% now to like 25% of OpenX. And um, beyond that, what what else are the, the CoinFlex creditors getting? Yeah, so they're also getting, and I think this is an extremely important part of it, they're also getting AUX tokens. So AUX token is the native token of OpenX. Um, it's something which has... Uh, we, we also issued AUX tokens to people who had Flex. Um, and so we created AUX token uh, as OpenX this year. Um, many people with Flex converted over and, and bridged their Flex into AUX. And effectively, it's the, the governance and native token of the OpenX exchange. But it's also the token of our staking product, the Herd, which is really more than, I think, the herd is more than just a staking product. It's also a community. Um, it's a community that exists on on many online forums, but it also exists in the form of artwork. People are putting out ox art all the time, and it's it's quite beautiful. Um, and really, the herd allows people. Obviously, they they capture some rewards in the form of our the different tokens that get emitted. We have a launch pad. We invest in things, and those projects sometimes pay tokens to the herd. But also, it's it enables people to not sell their ox. So it enables people to hold ox without having to worry about when they should sell, and they can they can hold for the duration of their stake and maybe even restake. And so, um, what the creditors are getting is ox tokens paid out every day for ten years, um, and it's a billion in total. And this is a very large number. Um, it's actually. Uh, it's about 25% of the existing aux is, is is 1 billion and so it's a it's a huge percentage of the aux total uh, total supply and, and and fully laid diluted supply um, and it's something where if aux goes back to um, you know certain prices the creditors will be made whole and so we wanted to create i mean this is what we wanted to do is we wanted to say look if the shares are go really well, and if the business goes really well, here's a path to being made whole. But even if the token goes well, um, you also have the path to be made whole by owning these tokens. And so we wanted to create these multiple paths towards restoration for creditors. And that was kind of a really important part. And that, that wasn't something that the restructuring plan specified. In fact, uh, the restructuring plan had no no token component on, on the on the exchange token side. Um, this is us just going above and beyond to try to make sure creditors feel as included as possible in our new efforts here. Yep. And um, based on my understanding, like these can't, is it correct that these can't be accessed for 10 years or is it like a gradual unlock? It's a gradual unlock. So every day you'll have some tokens released to you. And that's important as well because there's obviously if we did everything at the end of 10 years, that's a kind of terrible situation for creditors. If we did everything day one, that's actually a bad situation for creditors and AUX token holders yep. because lots of that would be sold, AUX would collapse, um, and then there'd be no recovery for the creditors that didn't sell. And also the AUX holders would, I mean, so when you're, th th this, is, this is the dynamic we've seen time and time again, especially with creditor situations, um, not just in the CoinFlex situation, but in others as well. But we've seen this dynamic where when you have a lot of parties at a table, um, you have to kind of think about, okay, if this party steps in, how does that impact the other parties at the table? Because some things, I, I, I believe in positive sum games, and I think this is a positive sum game. You know, we, we, I don't want to play a zero sum game or a negative sum game. Those are the worst, right? Um, uh, 
as Liz Bree calls them, Moloch traps. And and so I want to play a, a positive film game, but there there's an element of in the moment of a transaction, it can feel zero sum or or negative sum. And so you want even even if the scenario is actually massively positive sum, you want people to feel like um, it's positive sum at each step of the equation. And so when when those existing ox holders saw these creditors come onto the picture, they're like, well, these creditors didn't buy these ox coins. They didn't have to create market slippage and increase the price of my ox. Why, why should they get these ox for free? And um, and when these creditors saw this new business get created, I feel like they felt like some frustration as well. Like, wow, this business seems to be going really well. Why are people able to make money from it when I'm not making money from it yet? Or I haven't been been repaid yet. And so there's these feelings of frustration on each side. And, and and it's it's just naturally more complicated when you have thousands of people with these types of feelings. Um, and you want to just create as much positive sum uh, situations, including in the moment positive sum situations as possible so that everyone everyone can feel like they've they've got a win. Yeah, OK, I get that um, as well with the CoinFlex creditors like um... Uh, there, there was a, a composite that we were promised there that included things like RVUSD, which is probably probably worthless now based on information that is out there. And also there was like a, a USD component. And basically this was a lot less than previously estimated. Do you know why that is the case? I think it might have been yeah, like I... about 30% less or something like that. I could be wrong though. It was, it was a while ago. Yeah, I, I believe I do know why. And I believe it was the lower end of the range of estimates we gave. Um, again, uh, don't hold me to this. I'm, I'm going off mm. on the back of memory. And it, it was it was a long time ago. And a lot has happened in the last year. But um, but I think it was the lower end of, of what we estimated. And, and I, I believe this was because uh, the judge, the, the, the whole restructuring took a long time to approve. And so... There were fees that just ate into that that approval process, and and this is where I, I think I'm extremely glad we didn't go with um, a, an actual liquidator or an actual external uh, ex- externally managed firm. We've seen other bankruptcies. Obviously, you've seen the SBF one, uh, the yeah. FTX one, where it's it's half a billion a year, right? Five hundred million. Well, in, you were talking fees. about this in that uh, video you guys published just yesterday, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, I basically know for a fact that if we used a third party for this, um, all the money would be gone. I think our total legal fees on the restructuring were only 400K, which is incredible when you think about FTX where they're spending yep. half a billion dollars. And um, and so I, th- I think the, the, the reason the composite on the USDC side was less was just because it dragged out further. And so operating expenses of running the business uh, were several months extra, and so and so that that ate into uh, you know the, the the prices we ended up getting for selling the, that crypto eventually. Um, but the good thing is we we did we were able to distribute a very large amount of of cash, and now I think we're in a situation where we can also distribute tokens, ox, and uh, and shares. And I think you know these things have market values. Um, you know, we've 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 raised cash uh, as a, as a business at OpenX at, at pretty uh, interesting valuations to people. So I think if if people factor these things in, it's already starting to look like there could be a decent recovery here. And if if business gets to a large success point, I mean, it's it's a massive it's a massive win for creditors. They could even get more than their funds back. That would be great. Um, so you've given a few figures there like a bit more than 400k for all those legal fees and then do you have any other figures to give um relating to the the funds that were held in the restructuring like operating expenses and whatever else was a major cost i don't i don't have like i don't have specific numbers ahead uh, in front of me right now um i think we're we're really just focusing on building a business so um, I think the goal here is to build the biggest exchange in crypto 
And the goal, the, the way to do that is to focus on um, creating a new form of cl cross collateral, cross margin system and creating an extremely attractive brand. And so, um, but I don't, I don't have specific figures in terms of how those funds were spent. Um, really like a, a large amount of the funds were spent on legal and then, um, you know, pursuing different things. And then obviously uh, we have spent funds building the actual, the next business as well. And, and, and I think there's this conception that this was not authorized or people weren't aware of it, but really, um, of course it was authorized and uh, people were definitely aware of it. I think we were, we were extremely public about the fact that we were building OpenX um, from, from day one about building OpenX. You know, I, I didn't um, change my name. I'm the same Mark Lamb from yeah. CoinFlex and here I am, here I am building OpenX. So um, I think there's this conception that maybe um, some creditors were in the dark or not authorizing this, but you know, I've, I've checked my emails, I've checked my messages. I, I, I don't have any records of that. And, and I also do have records of, you know, we, we made this very clear to people. Um, we, we got full authorization to do this and, and, and we proceeded to doing it, to, to, to do it in a way where we could maximize the value for creditors as well. We didn't just, we're not just focusing on new investors that are providing cash to the business and supporting the business. Obviously we want to get those guys in as well. And we're very, We've, we've been blessed to have some incredible investors this year that have, have really done a lot for the company. But, um, but we're not only focused on those new investors, those new token holders, um, those new customers. We're also focused on the CoinFlex creditor base. And so we want to, again, we want to create a win-win-win scenario where everyone feels like they're, they're getting a good deal. Sounds good to me. So um, I noticed as well, like going back a few months now, you guys were looking at acquiring this HODLNOT exchange that was also yeah. in bankruptcy. So what's yeah. the current status with that? Has that gone ahead or what's going on there? Yeah, so that was, um, I think that kind of came out of our knowledge of the way bankruptcies work and we, um, we really basically, we realized there was an opportunity again for a, a, a scenario where everyone's a winner, where we could, um, we could pro we could capitalize on on this bankruptcy. We could help the creditors get their cash back, their their crypto back faster from Hodlnut um, and from from Hodlnut. Yeah. So the creditors of Hodlnut, we could basically make an offer to to acquire Hodlnut that resulted in the creditors of Hodlnut getting an immediate distribution of the vast majority of that remaining cash. And so basically the creditors would win, uh, OpenX would win because OpenX would effectively be um, uh, facilitating the, all of this and, and we would get new customers from it, but we would also increase the balance sheet from it. And then and then also um, uh, Hodlnut as as a business could could win as well because the business could kind of be brought back even in, in some some smaller form, but the customer base could be reinvigorated, and the the losers I guess would be the um, the liquidation professionals so the lawyers and and bankruptcy professionals involved in that liquidation, and um, I I I would say this was actually a massive success uh, you know in terms of sometimes you do a deal and 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 it works and sometimes you do a deal and and the person you're trying to do a deal with or the entity you're trying to do a deal with, uh, you know, kind of ends up doing doing something better for the world as a result of it. And I think um, we saw things there where that could have that could have gone on a long time. And again, it was a smaller bankruptcy. So you, you could have easily had a scenario where uh, those fees just took the rest of the uh, of the creditor, uh, the, the rest of the estate, basically, and the creditors got nothing. And um, I think because of the pressure we were putting um, on this alternative, uh, they had no alternative, right? There was no alternative buyer for Hodlnut. And so I think because of the pressure we were putting, um, I think the IJM and the, the lawyers and the bankruptcy professionals uh, became very professional and, and, and they've now, uh, they're now proceeding to liquidation. They're now proceeding to actually pay out all the clients. So I think we, um, we may not have won the deal ourselves. I think we, we, you know, we may not have won that deal, but we did, uh, we did put some 
useful pressure. And I think, it, you know, the creditors of Huddle Knot, I think it was like 75 or 80 percent uh, voted yes for the deal. So the creditors were incredibly supportive of us. We appreciated their support. And I think the uh, the professionals just took it as a sign. We got to get our stuff together and, and, and do this. And this is actually I mean, this is actually something we've learned in bankruptcies is you, crypto bankruptcies are very unique because you just don't have a lot of bankruptcies where there's mostly retail creditors. It's usually these bank creditors where the banks and the bankruptcy professionals have a very long term relationship. And so in crypto, um, the, the, the crypto creditor is probably only going to be once a creditor of a bankrupt company. Uh, and, and they're all, also probably quite small. So they don't have the same negotiating leverage with the bankruptcy professionals as as you find in like if we work goes bankrupt it's going to be banks and professionals just negotiating with each other and and they both know that there's yeah. going to be they're going to be doing this for 20 times in their career and so i think that's that's actually the problem with that's one of the many problems with crypto bankruptcies is um there's just this massive uh a different imbalance of 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 power and 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 a lack of repeat business basically i see so this deal is no longer going ahead according to what, what you said. No, th is that correct? That's, that's what I understand. I mean, they might change their mind, but I think they're, they've been approved to go into, yeah. to pay out all the, all the funds to clients. So it's a, it's a great out. Honestly, it's a great outcome for, for their creditors. Yeah. And I'm glad, I'm glad we were able to help. So uh, I was wondering as well, you offered to like buy them with flex tokens, right? So, um, yeah. Who was the owner of these flex tokens? Was it the was it Coinflex or no? It was it was the company. So it was OpenX. Yeah. Right. And um, another a point relating to that is that this uh, chain analysis company Nansen is saying that they actually saw some flex go from uh, what appears to be a Coinflex uh, address to Hodl Nort. And they're saying that uh, uh, it, this address that the funds came from was the mint recipient of Flex. So, do, have you are you aware of that? Do you, do you know how to explain that one? Yeah. So we separately sold uh, Flex coins. I think this is um, public information as well. We sold at, we OpenX that is uh, sold Flex coins to Hodlnot as well as as kind of a part of all of this. And and I think they. Um, you know, they got some good prices in that, and I think they seem to be happy with those purchases. But, um, but yeah, that was actually separate to the uh, acquisition offer we made to Hoddle Knot. But it was, it was also, you know, something we've done. Oh, okay. Recently. Yep. Makes sense. So, well, let's move on now to some other stuff that I was wondering about. Um, previously, yeah. we were required to do KYC to receive the yep. equity um, in addition to a number of other things like having those documents notarized and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. But recently this changed and since you've put out this tender offer, we are only required to do a signature. So why is it different now? Yeah, that's... That's been a really interesting question, and I, I, to be honest, I still don't feel like I have uh, an answer on that one that I'm I'm happy with. Um, I have not. I'm not our compliance officer. I'm also not our our Seychelles law firm, so I'm not the person that makes up the rules for that. Um, but I always felt like this notarization requirement was extremely cumbersome. Uh, if you're a Two thousand dollar creditor, for example, or a twenty thousand dollar creditor, even getting a notarized document is actually um, it's expensive. I'm, I'm sure if you're listening to this and you're a CoinFlex creditor, you know that uh, getting a notarized document isn't isn't the cheapest thing in the world. It's it costs fifty bucks, a hundred bucks, could be more. Um, uh, so that's that's quite annoying, and so. Um, but and and I I tried asking them okay is there any way we can remove this even just for the small creditors uh, is there any way we can remove this and they said no look it's a, it's a Seychelles trust and these trusts are heavily scrutinized um, and they're run in a certain way and there's 
there's no way under the current laws to actually remove it. Um, I said, okay, well, that sucks. But um, if that's the situation, that's the situation. And my understanding is um, the, the, that's the coin flex structure. The open X structure is, is a much simpler entity. It's, an, it's just an SPV. Um, but also the, the transaction that's being done right now uh, is basically a swap of equity for equity. So you're selling your claim to CoinFlex shares yep, or your yep. or your CoinFlex shares themselves. So there's two types of people here. Some people haven't gotten the shares yet, and some people have. And and if you haven't gotten the shares, you can participate in the tender offer just as much as if you have. So you're selling your either your claim or your actual shares, um, and you're in return getting OpenX shares, right? And um, for this specific transaction. No, no KYC is required um, uh, for for issuing the share for issuing the aux as well. Um, you know, it's it's also not not a legal requirement for actually issuing the uh, shares in the SPV. We're still getting information, and and we'll probably rely on those, you know, existing KYC people have done. But but you know, that's kind of a, a secondary step, effectively. But this all wasn't something. Uh, it basically wasn't something that I was in control of or something that I was even able to influence. I, you know, I tried influencing it to try to say, hey, can we remove the notary requirement and still have the KYC requirements? But um, that wasn't something I was able to get done. So, Oh, well, yeah, that's good. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, certainly it's way easier now, like less hoops to jump through and um, more accessible yeah. to more people as well. So yeah, it's always the goal. Um, the next thing I wanted to know is like these guys have come out and like they've made they've made a number of claims against you, and if you want, I'll just read through some of these things now. I've put some notes together so people know. They're saying um, you've breached um, fiduciary duty, set up competing business. Uh, diverted customers away, uh, misappropriating intellectual property, employees, confidential information, uh, falsely representing OpenX as CoinFlex rebrand, acting on behalf of uh, CoinFlex without board consent, like disallowing customers to withdraw Flex and Ox. And like it goes on, there's, there's a few more things, but you get the idea. Like there's a it's lot crazy. of uh, stuff here. So... Uh, what do you have to say to these claims that they've made against you? Like, is there any legitimacy to this? No, I, obviously there's no legitimacy to anything they're saying. It, at, at the heart of it, it's, it makes me extremely angry to, to have people throwing these types of false accusations at me when we're trying to build the biggest exchange in crypto and a big token community and, and a lot of interesting products that we feel like the market actually really, really needs. And, 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 you know, any, any amount of time I spend focusing on, on this stuff is really, um, it's really just taking away time we could be spending, um, focusing on, on actually building things. And so I have tried, uh, you know, and, and I, I think I've been able to, but I, I'm trying to focus just entirely on building and, and, and leave this to other people as much as I can. Um, Really, in my head, I, I do have a lot of sympathy for these people because not because not because they're right about any of the things they're saying. They're obviously wrong. Uh, but I do think bankruptcies are very complicated. Uh, they're very frustrating. Um, and and pressuring other people is, is a very common way um, to to attack people and, and, and to handle things in this type of situation when, when someone is frustrated or feels uh, you know, it feels like they they want to get their money back faster or something like that, and um, and it's confusing to me as well because I I have made I've done everything I've done this year publicly, right? It's not like I've been again I haven't been secretive about any part of OpenX, um, and this offer has also been on the table since the beginning of the year, so uh, uh, you know we we made it we made it accessible to people privately and, and, and try to get this approved at a, you know, at a board level and, and then got the approval of, uh, to, to build OpenX at a board level as well. Um, but this was basically something that was discussed and, and publicly, 
you know, of what people were aware of since the beginning of the year. And so what I don't understand is why they're deciding to take this course of action, because it feels quite antithetical to their interests, right? Their interests are in maximizing recovery. Well, the way to do that is, you know, maximize the amount of ox you hold, maximize the amount of shares you hold. Um, and there's been no feedback about the tender offer. They've actually said um, they like the terms. They've said they don't have any issues with the terms. Um, and so then I've asked like, okay, so if you don't have issues with the terms, is there something else you have issued with? Is there some other language that you don't like about the tender offer? And they said, no, we have no feedback on the tender offer. I said, okay, so we're was good this, here, right? Was and this they, after you published that publicly or was it like before, uh, before that? This was before and after. So before I had been discussing these terms with them privately, um, after I published the tender offer, uh, I also discussed it with, peop with, with many of the same people that are, uh, you know, writing these things and, and they had no feedback and they had, um, and they, and they thought their terms were actually very fair. So, um, so I am confused what their aim is. I understand, I, again, I, I understand that these frustrate, these, these things can be very frustrating, um, very, very, uh, you know, they, they're probably stressed out too. They're probably very, uh, they probably don't know what to do. You know, they probably feel like this is a lot of money for them. How do I, how do I deal with this mentally? Um, should I take this deal? Should I not take this deal? Uh, that, that sort of thing. And so I, I feel for all the creditors, large and small, um, that are in this situation. And, um, and obviously we tried to, we tried to have this resolved previously in a way where it doesn't have to be everyone signing on a tender offer, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's how it is now. And, um, and they can kind of do what they want. I also just think, um, in general, the truth wins out um, and in general, love wins out. And so you want to be on the side of truth. You want to be on the side of love and you want to create positive outcomes. Um, you know, I think, I think, I think also for these people that are saying these things, um, it, it can just be a tactic where right now they're saying this and then they get aligned and then they stop saying these things. You know, I, I we've seen that, uh, time and time again in crypto where someone will attack someone and then get aligned with them and then stop attacking. And, and I'm not really, again, ultimately the damage is just people are saying things on the internet. So it's, um, it's unfortunate, but people say things on the internet all the time. And so I'm used to it. Um, you know, when I first started coin floor, uh, I got attacked the first week by someone online, uh, who said that I, was getting into bit into business with someone who built a failed company before. Um, and, and, but that, that person, I, that person that I was in business with, I ended up learning a lot from and, and yeah, he built a company that failed in the past, but you know, it, it didn't, didn't mean he didn't have a lot to contribute to what we were building at coin floor. And I think, um, yeah, I just think for all these people that want to say things, um, you know, in a way, if it's cathartic to them, if it's um, emotionally valuable to them, that is almost a form of creditor recovery, right? Because if you can recover, uh, you know, by emotional catharsis, maybe I'm happy for you. Maybe, maybe I'm happy that you were able to say these things and you were able to feel like uh, you got this out. Ultimately, what I would like is for for all these people to to benefit financially, and so that's that's my goal. Um, but you know, if 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 they want to 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 vent as well, that's that's fine too. Um, and and hopefully, uh, once these things are all released, um, we can just be building together. And 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 I think a lot of them have great ideas to contribute as well, and great great positivity and and, and energy and. And, and youth and vibrancy and intelligence to contribute to what we're building here. And so, you know, that, that is my hope is that we, we can all be building together. But right now, you know, I'm going to try as much as I can to not focus on this stuff, 
and um, and the degree to which I do focus on it, I'll just do so as transparently as I can and and following different people's advice and, and continue doing what sure. I do. Um, based on a lot of what you're saying, it seems to me that you believe um, like a lot, a lot of what your actions have been recently are uh, it's the fastest path towards like recovering value for the creditors. Is that right? It seems to be totally. Yeah. I, yeah. My interpretation I, of I, this. I, 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 I certainly think so. I think, um, I think at the end of the day, uh, in, in some ways, this tender offer could have been done much earlier. And, um, and we were, we were kind of insistent on doing it, um, doing it with kind of the, the agreement of certain types of creditors and, and certain types of constituents. But actually, it would have been just it would have been just easiest to just publish this uh, at the beginning of the year and say, hey, here's the deal. Um, take it if you want or not. And uh, this is what we're building. And just, just kind of get people on, on the board that way. Um, I, I do think uh, this is just the best way to recover value because it's not like there's some alternative way to recover value. I think this is the only way to recover value. But also, OpenX is a real business. You know, we've got we've got revenues, we've got users. Um, there are people on the exchange. They come here because we have unique products. We were like the first place to list Rollbit perps and a number of other perps. Um, and we're doing a lot of things very, very differently to other exchanges and 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 also other token communities. So I think that trend will just continue and. Um, Especially, especially some of the things we have planned in the next few months. These are going to be very exciting, very interesting, um, very positive for the business. Um, and yeah, I, I, I do just think this is the best way to uh, to build back value. So, help us get a bit more of an understanding about like who this group is, because we don't really know anything about them, um, like, like people in the public. Obviously, you know who they are. So. Um, are you able to, in your in your tend offer, you've said that blog post. You said they are a minority of the larger creditors. So, what sort of percentage are we looking at here in terms of like the total creditor base? So I don't know offhand what percentage of the the creditor base by value, but I think really in terms of people that are trying to spend time on this, it's like two people. Uh, maybe maybe three or four people at most, um, and so um, so yeah. I'm just I mean, you know, they can spend time on this. I don't think it's gonna help anything necessarily. Um, it it would be one thing I think if they were saying these things and then trying to push for a different deal, but they've even said again. The same people have said that the terms are are fair. Um, they think they would be happy to do them. So I am, I am confused at, at what their intentions are here because I, I, I've asked their intentions directly to them um, and, and they haven't said. So I just think um, maybe, maybe it, is, uh, it is a bit of venting for a while before, before we eventually come together and create something beautiful. Um, but I'm I'm just going to focus on creating something beautiful, regardless, and um, and hopefully they 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 you know they join me in this. But if they don't, that's you know that's okay. I I'm not going to force anyone to be part of a business or part of a token community uh, that they don't themselves want to be a part of. And so um, you know I think that's that's the value of crypto is people can make up their own choices. They can. They can do things on governance votes. They can do things on forks. They can do things on all sorts of things where they get sovereign control of their own assets, and and that's that's great. So, um, I'm pretty sure this is coming close to the end. Uh, oh, so basically, you said there might be like four four or less people that are against this. So. How many other major creditors are you like in discussions with that 
are supportive of what you're doing? Well, are there like many more than that? The, or? Oh, the, I mean, the supporters are, are uh, you know, we've had like dozens of 500K plus 1 million plus uh, creditors sign. So um, the vast majority of basically almost all of the um, large creditors I spoke to, I've spoken to pretty much everyone uh, in the 500K plus or $1 million plus category. And they've all been supportive of the deal. Um, I think maybe maybe one or two exceptions in there, but you know, it's 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 a large group. That's a, that's a small number. Uh, so so they've all been supportive of it. Some have said uh, we're going to take a bit more time, or we're going to take less time. Um, some signed on the spot. Some you know basically wanted wanted to get an understanding of certain things. Um, and I think after those understandings, they've all been very positive. So I think, you know, it's, it's gone well. Um, and we're now just trying to basically wrap it up effectively. Um, and yeah, I'm, 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 I'm extremely encouraged by the people that have come on board as well, because, you know, again, this is a large group of the CoinFlix creditor base that's, that was actively trading on CoinFlex back when it was operating. And so I think, these people coming into OpenX, it's going to be very positive for the whole situation. Do you know what the position of Smart BCH Alliance is? I I don't. I've um, yeah, I, I I don't. Cool. All right. Well, um, do you have any other further closing comments so we can wrap this all up? No, just I I appreciate the work you do. Um, I appreciate. Uh, your time to, to ask me these questions and, and get to this, to this, to these answers. I think, um, you know, for a lot of these, I think it's been, uh, it's been somewhat tricky to know how to respond to this because to some degree you don't want to feed, um, random accusations online, but I think to some degree as well, if people have legitimate concerns, um, it is sort of important to address those. So I'm, I'm glad we're doing this and hopefully we'll be, um, really, really valuable to people. I hope so too. Um, and one last thing before we go, I thought I would let you know, like I know you didn't want to talk about Roger stuff, but uh, I'm probably going to interview him at some point later. And, you know, if you wanted to get anything out there regarding him, now's the opportunity. You know, I want to give you guys uh, equal opportunity to speak about things. So yeah, that, that's where I'm coming from with regards to that? Um, maybe at some later point right now, I think we're really focused on uh, obviously the tender offer, but also just mostly the business. So I'm not, I'm not trying to um, talk a lot about, uh, about other matters. Very good. All right, well, thanks very much, cool. Mark, and we'll end things there. Um, go check thanks out so OpenX, guys, and uh, yeah, if you like this video, make sure you share it, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you all next time.